So when you converted the precipitation data and the rodent data into time series objects and then ran them through the ACF function, what you should have found was that rain, which I'm showing here, looks very similar to the NDVI signal. But you probably received a bit of a surprise when we looked at the rodent data because this signal is really, really different. And it turns out that these ACF plots can be really useful in helping you understand exactly how your time points are correlated with each other. And it turns out there are two different ways that a time point in the past can have an influence on a time point in the future. And these plots are diagnostic of those two different ways. So we're gonna jump over to the whiteboard screen and let's talk about why these plots look this way, how different time points can influence each other, um, and what this means for uh, thinking about the dynamics in the system. So there are two different types of autocorrelation processes where a time point in the past can have an influence on a time point in the future. And these two different general types of processes are called a moving average process and an autoregressive process. This is where things get a little confusing because we spent last week talking a lot about moving averages. And this is the same name for something that is totally different. So when we talked about moving averages last week, we were talking about taking these windows and sliding them along our data and taking averages of all the time points that occurred within that window. A moving average process in the context of autocorrelation is a way that the past influences the future through errors. The best way to think about this is to think about a system where there is some mean state to the system. And the way that things change through time is through, say, perturbations. If I've had a big perturbation that has pushed my system away from the mean at a, at a particular time point, then that next time point when I come and measure is still gonna have that influence of that disturbance as the system slowly settles back down towards the mean. And this is what we call a moving average process. The way you would write a moving average process is an equation for those who uh, like to have that clarity of the math. This is what we've been calling our focal observation. This is our value of something at time t. So focal observation and the equation that generates that observation is long-term average, the mean state of the system, plus the error at time t, however far it's being moved away from that central tendency, plus the error at time t, minus one. And so this is how that past influences the future. So if a big disturbance in the past, it will tend to leave a, a, a signal pushing the value at time t away from that mean. So what I'm showing you now is our NDVI autocorrelation function graph. And this graph is a classic example of a moving average signal. In a moving average signal, these disturbances don't tend to have really long lasting effects. Um, and so in this case, by the second time step, we can see that the signal has decayed rapidly and then disappears. Let's think about this biologically for a second. So what we have in a desert system is a system that is often at a mean value of dirt, uh, for want of a better way of describing it. That greenness is almost, you can think of it as a disturbance to this baseline state of not green. And therefore, the signal that we're getting through NDVI is a very short-term perturbation. That value that you're seeing at some future time is really being determined by how far off this mean dirt level the system got during a particular uh, peak. Now let's talk about the rodents. So let's think for a moment why the rodents may be showing a very different autocorrelation structure than NDVI. A lot of that is because this is a population process. And so this creates more of a effect of the numbers that you have from the previous time step having an influence on the numbers that you see now. So the rodents are really this other process, and that's an autoregressive process. An autoregressive process is probably what you have had in your head as you've been thinking about autocorrelation all along, which is the idea that the value that you see in the past has an influence on the value that you see in the future. So I'm going to quickly write the equation for an autoregressive uh, process for a time series.
you'll see a variety of things that are very similar between the moving average equation and the autoregressive equation. Obviously, in both cases, we're predicting some focal observation at time t. We have an error term related to that observation at time t. This term here, which involves the value at t minus 1 plus a coefficient. This is a coefficient. And there's also a coefficient up in the moving average. I just want to make sure it's clear that it's not the, co the fact that there's a coefficient that it's the difference. It's the fact that here the value at t minus 1 is being used to predict the value at time t, whereas under a moving average equation, the error at t minus 1 is being used to predict the value at uh, of y at time t. Looking at this, you can see how the type of information that's being brought from the past is a very different type of information that's being used to explain a value in the future. What is probably less clear to you is why that pattern of autocorrelation is so different in the autoregressive version as opposed to the moving average version. So let's go back and look at our example time series that we started the session with and think about what this correlation between values means and how it can amplify through a time series. So let's say we have a really strong correlation at a t minus 1, which means, of course, that this value at t minus 1 here is having a very strong influence on the value that you're going to see at time t. Now this strong correlation between the value at t minus 1 and t isn't unique to this particular pair of observations. Every set of observations that are only one observation apart are going to have this very strong correlation. Then it probably means that these two data points have some level of correlation to each other that is emerging through this pathway of strong correlations at t minus 1. And so you can start to get still a strong correlation between two data points that are two steps apart that is emerging solely from the fact that there are very strong correlations being driven at this one time step apart. And that's how you get this echoing effect that can emerge in your ACF graphs for time series that are experiencing an autoregressive process.